Good afternoon. It is Tuesday, September 27th, and we are calling this meeting to order. The City Council uh, will next convene in City Council Chambers to hold an executive session for the purpose of consulting with the City staff regarding the following. Pending or contemplated litigation or settlement agreement and to hold consultation with the attorney under Section 551.071 of the Texas Government Code and the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property under Section 551.072 of the Texas Government Code. Uh, we will move into executive session, and then we will come back in for our regular session. And at this time, we are in recess. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. We are back from executive session. It is um, Tuesday, September 27th. It is 2 p.m. And at this time, I'd like uh, you all to rise as we welcome Pastor Steve McMeans with Indiana Avenue Baptist Church for our invocation. We will follow that with our pledges. Let's pray together, please. Our Father, we thank you that we are so blessed. We thank you for an incredibly gorgeous day today in a wonderful city. We thank you for your presence in this very room. We thank you for a representative government that we have instead of dictatorship. Thank you so much for that. Thank you that we can still pray in this room. What a blessing that is. We thank you that righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. So we pray that all the decisions made in this room today would be righteous. They would be the right decisions. And we ask that you help these that are responsible to do that. We pray today, Lord God, for our president. We pray for our governor. We pray for our mayor. We pray for this city council. And we ask that you would help them today to make incredibly good decisions that would help Lubbock in every way. So we pray for all that. We thank you that we can pray because you love us. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please join us as we pause for the American and Texas flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas one state under God, one indivisible. Thank you. You may be seated. <laughs> All right. Agenda item three is calls for citizen comments, and this week we have no citizen comments. Uh, so we will next move to the minutes, uh, agenda item 4.1, which is July 27th of 22, special city council meeting for LIDA, the August 23rd regular city council meeting, and the September 6th special city council meeting for the budget and tax rate public hearings. If I could entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor of approval of agenda item 4.1, please say aye. 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 Any opposed by like sign? All right. Motion carries 7-0 to approve the minutes. All right. Next, we will move to our consent agenda. Uh, we will take up agenda items 5.1 through 5.17. As there were no pools this week from the consent agenda, I would ask for a motion to approve agenda items 5.1 through 5.17. Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Thank you, Mr. Massengill, Ms. Joy. All in favor of approval of consent agenda items 5.1 through 5.17, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed by like sign? All right. Approval of the consent agenda. Items 5.1 through 5.17 carries 7 to 0. All right, we will next move to our regular agenda. Uh, the first item we have is a public hearing. This is to conduct the second of two public hearings to receive comments on the juvenile curfew ordinance. 
and consider a resolution to find that the City of Lubbock Juvenile Curfew Ordinance shall be either abolished, continued, or modified. And per the Texas Local Government Code, it requires the public hearings to be conducted in City Council in regard to the Juvenile Curfew Ordinance and its effects on the city. And we did see a presentation uh, from the uh, Lubbock Police Department at our last regular meeting. Uh, so this will be the second of the two public hearings. And at this time, I will open up the public hearing for the juvenile curfew ordinance. Any wish to speak in favor of or in opposition of the curfew ordinance may approach now. As you do approach, if you'd please speak your name and your address into the microphone and um, proceed from there. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council, city manager, uh, the opportunity to come forward and, and speak on this uh, topic. I'm Thomas Nichols, retired chief from the Lubbock PD, live at 3404 63rd here in Lubbock. I'm here to speak in strong support of uh, the proposal uh, Chief Mitchell has made pertaining to the enforcement of the juvenile curfew ordinance. This is much, much more than just juvenile enforcement and getting kids off the street. This is a comprehensive effort, crime reduction, traffic safety, reducing crimes against violence, crimes against property, and overall uh, improvement of, of the quality of life in the city. The old saying is uh, what goes around comes around. And uh, when I first heard the chief with this proposal, it took me back to about 1985 when I was chief. Uh, we did this exact same thing. It's an ad hoc effort, and uh, we, we did it very similarly with a little bit of differences is we, uh, I believe we rented a piece of property, either the school district or the parks department down in the Ballinger neighborhood. Uh, we developed very specific policy on how we would handle juveniles and their parents or guardians a very specific policy to pertain to the safety and well-being of anybody using that facility. And uh, the facility was inspected by the uh, Lubbock County uh, Juvenile Authorities, approved it for the safe short-term keeping of the juveniles. And we did exactly what the chief is talking about doing now. And uh, we did two, three, four nights a week, and uh, juveniles were picked up and taken to the uh, short-term detention center. Their parents or guardians were called. Most of the time they showed up. The child got a ticket and the parents got a ticket. And the only response we had that I was aware of as chief at the time was generally when you start something new, you get a lot of feedback and generally it's negative feedback. Uh, that following Monday, the phone started ringing. Lo and behold, it was about the ordinance and our enforcement. I've never heard so many happy people, businesses uh, along 34th Street, 50th Street, and Slide Road, people who had not been called out over the weekend to fix their broken windows, they didn't come in on Monday morning, have to sweep up the beer cans and the trash and so forth. Everybody was pleased with it, and I mean everybody. I don't think I took one negative comment even from a parent. So I see this program as being very, very similar uh, to what we did, uh, I think 1985, 87, something like that. So what goes around comes around. So if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chief. We appreciate you very much, and thanks for what you do for our community still. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. I'm Floyd Price, retired police officer. Of police department 33 and a half years to the date. And I was on the ground floor of that curfew center. And uh, it was more than a curfew center. Uh, I want to commend the chief of police at this time, Chief, police, uh, chief Mitchell, for bringing this to the forefront. Simply because the curfew center was more than a curfew center. We did not call it a detention center, we called it a curfew center. And the thing that we did, we educated the parents that they picked up the children. It was more than just getting the children off the street. It was getting the parents involved in crime prevention. I was a crime prevention officer for 15 years 
for the city of Lubbock. And we brought crime to a screeching halt as far as young people was concerned because we got them off the street. And not only did we get them off the street, we had counselors that was volunteered, didn't cost the city a dime. They volunteered to talk to the parents and also to the children. And what we did when the parents would come, we would talk about prevention, not only for keeping the kids at home, keeping them safe. We talked about prevention. We set up uh, neighborhood watch programs. We had all types of literature that companies made a contribution to us. So the city wasn't out of anything. We had plenty, plenty cooperations from the parents because we set up Lubbock as a crime prevention city through and connected with the curfew center. So this is an excellent tool to uh, get your crime lowered in the communities. And we made friends with these young people. The police department did, the, and I was one of the officers there at the center. And being in crime prevention, and uh, the state and the federal government funded a lots of our programs. All our, our schooling was funded by the state and grants by the federal government. And of course, we had some of our state representatives that was real uh, involved with us also. We had the number one prevention program in the state. We got plenty recognition because of the fact that we brought crime just about to a, a, a screeching halt. And you know how it is, when you get things under control, everybody will say, we've got it. And then when we got it under control and they stopped the program, and of course, Back then, we had gangs just like we do now, but they was gangs that was organized at a set. Right now, all the gangs, is, they're not fighting each other. They're out there doing their thing. But what we did also, we uh, talked to merchants, and we had children that we had curfewed. We had children that uh, would sign a, state, uh, sign a little card and say, we're no longer going to get involved in crime. And we went to the merchants of the city of Lubbock. And what the merchants did, they would give those kids a, a discount if they showed that card. And also, we had it where those kids would tell us who the gang members were. They taught us all the signs. They taught us who was there. And that came through our curfew center. And so we worked in the school, because the schools didn't have police officers like they do now. And of course, you know, social media is going to bring a different situation. We didn't have that back there then. But just to let you know that uh, what talking to the kids will do, making friends with them, they're going to tell you everything's going on now. And we'd had kids that had still, were still in the gang when we would have group meetings. And they would say, well, we're out of the gang. Some of the kids said, no, you're lying. You're not. So he's not. He's not. And what we would do, we'd take their cards from them. So they couldn't get a discount. But the kids would tell us who was doing and who wasn't doing. And so this is an excellent program to reinforce the people of Lubbock to, and also we talked to the Apartment Association, Lubbock, uh, the Home Builders Association, taught them how to, when you build a new home, make it a crime prevention home from the get. So all this bought Lubbock as a crime prevention city. Neighborhood watch, we had neighborhood watch on every corner. And so this program will eliminate a lots of crime because when you stop in a juvenile, you don't know what that person that is with that juvenile is. And if they weren't a parent, a legal guardian, that person got checked. And, and sometimes we find warrants, federal warrants on those people. And so they wouldn't be out prowling and tearing up as much because they know as a, eventually you may get stopped. So I, I, I recommend that give it a try, and I guarantee you, you won't be sorry that you did. I'll entertain any questions that you may have. Ms. Joy. Are you ready to go back to work? <laughs> I think you could do it, Floyd. <laughs> uh, one thing you mentioned is is the communication with with the children. Um, did you get to know a lot of these kids pretty well? You know, we do community policing, 
to me, this is a part of that effort on the part of uh, the police department in the city. Well, I got to know lots of those kids real well, and some of the kids, they still keep up with, I keep up with them. And I've got some kids that are the attorneys now. Oh, okay. And I got some that is doctors now. And so I tell you, it worked. Kids will actually, they will be your best friend if they think that you care about them. Okay. Any Thank other you. questions? Thank you. Appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Price. Again, we appreciate what you continue to do for our community as well. All right, anyone else wanting to speak? Good afternoon, Council. Josh Shankles. I live in the 2600 block of 47th Street. And um, I'm rising to speak um, in favor of abolishing this measure. Um, I think some admirable things have been said today, but I would challenge this council and the public to reframe this issue or thinking about it in a new way entirely. Um, public safety is something that happens before an incident and to prevent an incident. And emergency response is the thing that happens after an incident and the place that we don't want to get to, in fact, in most cases. Uh, and what this measure is, is an emergency response and does not address the underlying conditions in any way um, that cause the problem that it is has been identified is a problem. Um, I would remind the council and the public that as they become a certain age, the kids of our town are taxpayers. They pay income tax on the jobs that they work. They pay to fuel their vehicles. They are citizens of our nation and enti as entitled to move around it freely as any one of us are, in fact. Um, what, if it is that the public and this council sees this as a problem, what it calls for is an investment in our communities um, such that we start to stave off the effects of rot and decay and underinvestment that we have seen take hold in many parts of our community and uh, start to show themselves across our infrastructure, across our public sectors. So. Um, while I've heard it oft talked about public safety in this room, I would challenge the council to think about this as a public safety manager and as something that should have a proactive and forward thinking solution to it rather than a, a putative sort of measure that would in fact um, financially burden families that are probably in most cases already financially burdened and would burden the time moving through the court system of families who are probably, if the behavior of their youth or any indication, already time burdened. Um, and so I think the council should consider that as they start to think about this measure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shanklin. Anyone else wish to speak on the juvenile curfew ordinance? My name is Eric Lampert. I work at 1602 Texas. Um, I came here not related to this issue at all, um, but uh, Mr. Price's comments kind of hit me and I thought I'd stand up for a second. Um, I've had conversations with a lot of you on a lot of other issues. Um, obviously nervous to be up here. This isn't always who I am, but I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, essentially in the war zone with just my mom. She never made probably over eh, $35,000 a year, which in her entire life. Anyways, I just point this out to say Mr. Price's, I believe, comments hit me because you know my I have three kids, seven-year-old boy, six-year-old daughter, four-year-old daughter. My wife just read this book about the power of mentors, um, especially in a young boy's life. 
And what Mr. Price mentioned is so true that while some, the other gentleman mentioned that this could be reactive, I disagree that when they make relationships with these children, they start mentoring them. Um, and even getting to stand up here before you, men and women, I'm nervous, but I think that these are the types of uh, relationships that um, inspire kids. Um, Mr. Griffith, a former councilman here, before he left, I had the chance, he graciously offered my kids to come and tour this place, and my kids still talk about it. My daughter was five at the time and said, I want to do this when I grow up. And so, anyways, I'm rambling, but I just wanted to point out the, the importance of mentors, of police officers, of city officials, and just point out that from somebody who grew up without a dad, just my mom in a small neighborhood, I'm not saying this is the answer, but it is important that these people are around these kids. And, you know, I, I think whether it's funding it this way or, or whatever, um, I'm hoping that there's ways that we can be involved in these kids' lives. And again, I don't exactly know what that looks like, but you know, there's some gentlemen that have done this for a long time and pointed it out, and I'm thankful for some of those comments and that we're trying to figure this out. So for what it's worth, thank you. Thank you, Eric. All right, any other comments while the public hearing is open? All right, the public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion on agenda item 6.1? Mr. Mayor, I move to continue the juvenile uh, curfew ordinance as set forth in the Texas Government Code section 370.002. All right, I have a motion to continue the juvenile ordinance. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. All right, all in favor of continuing the juvenile ordinance, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed by like sign? All right, motion to continue the juvenile ordinance carries 7 0. All right, Council, um, it's my understanding that we may have. Um, Further discussion required on agenda item 6.7 and 6.8, uh, but with council's approval, I would ask that we bring in 6.2 through 6.6, .6, as well as 6.9 through 6.11, and open those up for public hearing collectively, if that's okay. And then we can move those into one vote if we don't need further discussion. And then we can pull out 6.7 to 6.8 individually. Is that all right? All right, this time without any objection from council, we will move uh, to, or we will conduct one public hearing. So if you are here for agenda items 6.2 through 6.6, .6, or 6.9, 6.10, and 6.11, the public hearing is now open for any comments on those agenda items. All right, if you please remember to state your name, your address, and which agenda item you're speaking. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. I'm Terry Holman. I'm with Hugo Reading Associates. We're at 1601 Avenue N. Uh, I'm representing items 6.9 and 6.10 this evening. Uh, they are uh, zone cases running in tandem with preliminary plats that we had approved at planning and zoning this last month. They're, in my view, fairly straightforward, comprehensive zoning uh, request but I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, anyone have any questions of Terry 6.9 or 6.10? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Will Stevens. I'm with AMD Engineering at 6515 68th Street. Uh, I'm here speaking uh, for 6.2. 6.3 and 6.11. Um, I don't have any further comments, but if you do have any questions, I'll be ha happy to answer them. Does anyone have, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, Mr. Stevens, is your client here? 
for the one of these three six cases. Six point three. Six Is that point client three. Here? I don't believe so, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. I think they just completed uh, a project that's adjacent yes, to this one. And there have been issues about where they stored their equipment while they were working. Yes, ma'am. I would really like to get a commitment from them okay. that they will not park their equipment on somebody else's property okay. without a written agreement. Right. Because I, that really makes makes it hard on definitely. neighbors, especially when you're in such a contained area. Right. But I know I've spoken to the owner, and he made it seemed like that he had moved that equipment since that had happened. And this property is going to be further north than I think that adjacent property that was affected. Um, this well, is they're still property. adjacent to part of that property. And, and I just, and it's not just this one, but it's all over town where mm -hmm. people just, if they want to park something that doesn't belong on a property, it doesn't belong to them, they just do like it. Yeah. Uh, but this one became a real issue. So would you convey that to your just owner mm -hmm. that, he not do that, or right. they not do that again. Without an easement, temporary working easement or something. That Without allows. something in writing. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. I can do that. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Oh. Martinez-Garcia. Yes, Sorry. I'm in, in the same agreement with okay. what Council um, Woman Joy also expressed. We want to make sure that we are conscious of the neighbors around that area. And... Um, we don't want to make exceptions that we will pay for later. So yes, if you'll please express that, that would be good. I, I surely will. Yeah. Any other questions on those items? On those items, we will hear for. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. All right, Ms. Joy. Is there anyone here on 6.4? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for City Council. I'm Nee Clark. I live at 2123 15th Street. I'm for case 2072 slash B. Do you have any questions? I don't have a question, but I did want to congratulate you and uh, tell you how much I appreciated the presentation that you made ah, thank you. to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go online. Uh, she detailed it, she pictured it, uh, she had supporting um, letters from uh, tenants, yes. uh, and really uh, just did a superb job oh, thank of you conveying, so much. Uh, conveying your, uh, your request, but I appreciate that very much. I treat it as a, like a dissertation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm going through PhD one, one more time. <laughs> thank you. All right, then. Ms. Martinez Garcia. Yes, I appreciate that you did. Uh, that was what planning and zoning was very specific on how much detail you provided. So thank you for that. I wish all citizens would do that. Um, I think I probably only have one concern, and yes. that is just to make sure how are you going to address if a, a resident mm -hmm. actually has a vehicle or not? Are you going to write it into the lease to assure that that doesn't happen? Well, no, that's not our concern. Uh, we always ask, uh, do you have a car or not? Uh, but it does not uh, affect we take them as a tenant. Uh, because uh, in the past uh, 11 years, and uh, it, has not, it has not been an issue. And then in last presentation, the uh, worst uh, parking is has only two cars parked uh, on the street. It's uh, just one year. So I don't think that's become a... Uh, problem based on the 10 years experience. Mm -hmm. This is hard to guarantee without actually putting it into the lease or anything. We don't put lease because I don't think that's fair to, are you asking, we treat uh, tenants uh, differently based on their cars? Well, what I'm asking you or implying is that I want to make sure that it is not going to create more traffic in an area oh. where there is a lot of traffic. Uh, you, are you asking me to guarantee that? I cannot guarantee that. <laughs> uh, by faith. I guarantee by my faith. Thank you. 
Thank you for your concern. Ms. Joy. How many apartments do you have at that location? Only six units upstairs. Okay, thank you. Do you all have any other questions? Does anyone have any other questions? All right, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for listening. All right. Anyone wanting to speak in favor or have any comments on those agenda items 6.2 through 6.6? and 6.9 through 6.11. All right. Good afternoon, my name is Stacy Butts. I am a cosmetic tattoo artist here about 6.6. Um, I apologize on behalf of Chloe Williams. She is the owner of Sublime Skin, which is the business located at 3804 um, 21st. And she had a death in the family, is trying to get back right now from a funeral, but I can't guarantee she's gonna be here. And I know she had some literature she wanted to share with all of you about just exactly what Sublime Skin is. Um, I would like to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I understand whenever the term tattoo parlor, tattoo <laughs> studio, <laughs> tattoo anything comes up. Um, I know in planning and zoning, there were some whispers when that was said, and then once we explained it, it was kind of kind of dissipated that concern. So I would love to answer any questions that you may have. Um, this is, yes, a, a, I am a cosmetic tattoo artist that will be incorporating paramedical tattooing in with what I do. I currently am a caregiver at Covenant. I assist one of our CEOs. I intend to keep that position there because I love it. And they have been incredibly supportive. They know exactly where we are right across the alley from Covenant Specialty Hospital. They're extremely supportive. You're just gonna take my word for it because I didn't bring anybody with me. Um, but I'd, I would love to answer any questions that you have and assuage any concerns that you may hold. Mr. McBrayer. Yes, I, I thought you did a, a very good job at that uh, PNZ meeting explaining exactly how you distinguish the kind of tattooing that you do. It's, it's, it's medical. It's, uh, yes, sir. It's aesthetic to help people who've had surgeries and need cosmetic tattooing to help uh, restore or recover a look to Absolutely. their body that is now missing. You did a great job of that, and it, it answered a lot of questions. Not that there's anything wrong with the tattooing <laughs> parlor itself, but it, your business fits in with right. the kind of clientele that goes to that area for medical procedures, and you fit right within that, and you did a very good job of explaining that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And that's, that's what we hope to do. We want this to be kind of a bridge of you know what they already do at Sublime and then what we have to offer to the many, many people that are in our area there in the medical district for a number of reasons. I'm actually, my eight to five is in the Joe Arrington building. Um, so I, I pass these, these wonderful people every day and um, know their struggles and whatever I can do to help them or to help anyone else, I look forward to being able to offer those services to them. Ms. Joy? Are you currently operating uh, this facility? Uh, no, I'm, I'm ready to pull the trigger you just <laughs> as soon done as it you yet. guys are. Right now I, um, I have some really brave family and friends that are just... Um, allowing to be, they are allowing themselves to be my models as I wait to get licensed. I cannot be, I cannot be licensed with the Department of Health mm -hmm. until we actually have a location. The Department of Health requires that I have a letter from the city stating that I can be, they don't really license a person, they license a location. They want to be assured that I'm in the right location as far as zoning is concerned and that the location itself meets their requirements. Um, on the inside, how it's constructed, the suite that Sublime Skin is in meets all of those requirements, um, along with providing the kind of environment and aesthetic that we want for our clients. So I'm, I'm waiting to be, to have this completely behind us, hopefully October 11th, that I can be the first one on the Department of Health's doorstep to say, let it go. I guess it goes to my question, you are in apartment medical district now and asking for C4, so um, I'm assuming that the apartment medical doesn't allow you to operate a cosmetic uh, tattoo business. No, ma'am, there's no differentiation between cosmetic okay. tattooing and, and what would you would consider traditional tattooing, um, either on the <laughs> state or the local level, actually. That's why we're all regulated by the Department of Health, so I'm not, I'm not working technically right now. We're, yeah. we're waiting, we want to have all of this all of our ducks lined up, every I dotted and every T crossed before we really. Yeah, I, I guess I hate that uh, it has to be in a C4. I wish it was allowed in a C3. Uh, 
but I hope you're successful. Thank you. And we don't have to face another C4 business that people don't like. <laughs> I understand. Okay. And, I, and I appreciate what you all do. I mean, it, it makes perfectly good sense. And I know that if I was especially a resident or if I was one of the physicians or other medical providers in that area, I, I would certainly have the questions. So I certainly do understand the concerns. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Martinez-Garcia. But it also makes perfectly good sense in what you're offering and in the area that you're going to offer. So I think it's a very positive thing. Thank you. So I agree. So thank you for thank doing you that. Much. Something definitely new for our community. I hope so. <laughs> Any other questions for Ms. Butts? All right. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you for your time. All right. Anyone here speak in favor of 6.2 through 6.6 .6 or 6.9 through 6.11? Is there anyone here wishing to speak in opposition of the aforementioned agenda items or have any other comments on those agenda items? All right, I will now close the public hearings on 6.2 through 6.6 .6 and 6.9 through 6.11. We have a motion to approve those agenda items. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. McBrayer. Is there any further discussion a council wishes on those agenda items. All right. All in favor of approval of agenda items 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, 6.5, 6.6, and 6.9, 6.10, and 6.11. Please say aye. 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 Any opposed by like sign? All right. Motion passes seven zero. All right, we will now move to agenda items. When are those? The 11th, All right, we will have second readings on those October 11th. All right, now we are moving to agenda item 6.7. Uh, this is a public hearing, uh, zone case 1131-P. We will have separate public hearings for 6.7 and 6.8. At this time, I will now open up the public hearing for any of those wishing to speak in opposition of uh, agenda item 6.7. Any wishing to speak in uh, opposition of agenda item 6.7. All right, seeing none, we'll move to anyone wishing to speak in favor of agenda item 6.7. You may come forward. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. Um, my name is Laura Pratt. I'm an attorney from the local law firm of Brady and Hamilton at 1602 13th Street. Uh, and we represent JCW Development, the applicant in this uh, zone case. Uh, first, as a former City of Lubbock employee, I'm always so grateful for what you guys do and so thankful to be able to come back to these meetings. Uh, knowing the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting that this came out of was ridiculously long. Um, I also wanted to say on the record how appreciative we were of staff for that meeting. They did an exceptional job kind of navigating. We had lots of speakers at that meeting and we're grateful for everything that they did. Um, I apologize in advance for this being kind of a more detailed comment, uh, but we're trying to specifically address and alleviate some concerns that were mentioned at the PZC meeting. Um, in hopes of gaining approval for the request. Uh, so essentially the specific use zone change request is being submitted to effectuate the redevelopment of the southwest corner of the building located at 3249 50th Street. Um, it's the portion of the building that has been vacant for many, many years. 
Uh, JCW actually intends to redesign and renovate that portion of the building and the infrastructure of that corner of the property uh, to facilitate a state-of-the-art plasma center operated by BioLife Plasma Services, a subsidiary of Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Uh, and the landlord, as indicated in your agenda packet, the landlord is actually in favor of this request and supports this request. Uh, JCW's development of this portion of the commercial shopping center uh, will revive a portion of a commercial building that is set vacant at the intersection of two main thoroughfares. Um, it will also generate jobs, support economic activity in that area, promote public safety in that area, and contribute to our already nationally recognized dominance as a medical hub here in West Texas. Um, so in support of this request, and as I see you guys all looking at, um, we've provided you like a detailed letter and some background information on BioLife, Takeda, uh, and some responses to the community concerns. Um, that's a big part of what BioLife does. Uh, they want to be good neighbors when they come into a new city, and they want to be here. And so the information that you have hopefully helps kind of address some of those concerns that sometimes arise when you say in um, a plasma-related industry. Uh, to also, you know, to help me answer questions, because, you know, I'm only the attorney, right? Uh, I also have with me today Jeff Terrace, and Luke Lentz. Jeff is the VP of Development of JCW. He's in the back row. Can you just wave? Yeah. And then Luke is beside him. He's actually a plasma center group manager at another BioLife center uh, that's already in operation here in Texas. So some benefits of the project. Um, this building, as I stated before, has been vacant for a while, or this portion of the building. Um, it's going to be an extensive redesign and renovation build-out. Um, they're not just going to move right in. Uh, there's, it's going to take some work. Uh, so out of that redesign and build-out, we're looking at promoting energy efficiency, uh, eliminating unnecessary plastic waste, focusing on carbon neutrality, and conserving water resources. Um, additionally, as shown in tab two of your packets, uh, the exterior renderings um, show the entrance to the facility is going to be reconfigured to face Indiana Avenue versus the front uh, 50th Street. Uh, and that's been very intentional for this space. Um, one, it's going to reduce a lot of traffic around that 50th Street intersection and the two turn-ins that are a little closer to the intersection. Uh, it's also going to decrease loitering along that west side and the rear side of the building because now we have a storefront there. Uh, it's going to hopefully very much improve the exterior of that building, uh, especially along that ma other major thoroughfare. Um, you're no longer looking at the side of the building. You're actually looking at a healthy business in that space. Um, and it's going to better utilize the parking of that shopping center. Because if you can see from like the survey and some of those renderings, there's a bunch of commercial parking spaces along that side, but usually most of the parking is directed towards the front, so it's going to kind of distribute that a little bit better. Community impact, which is always fun to talk about the numbers that are going to come into Lubbock because of a venture like this. Two to three million dollars per year are expected to go into the hands of donors here within Lubbock. 100% um, of that's going to be on debit cards. This is a no cash facility. Um, BioLife will not have cash at the facility for any type of donors that come in. Historical data for similar type facilities indicate that over 80% of those donor payments are used within the local committee and even within a specific radiance, radius of the facility itself, uh, which is great. You're looking at a potential of 1.6 to $2.4 million spending infusion into the shopping center and the local retail market. Um, and if you're familiar with that area, I mean, Market Street is right across the street, um, which is a great pairing, you know, for these debit cards to come in, and then we're turning around and putting it right back into, the, into our local community. Um, permit fees, increases in tax revenue, improvements to the vacant building, are just some of the additional positives to that neighborhood. Uh, and they're expecting that this project will create anywhere from 50 to 70 new jobs uh, with benefits on day one. 
So in response to some of the opposition, uh, because again, BioLife wants to be a good neighbor, and you know, I appreciate that process. Um, I appreciate that we get those kind of, that kind of feedback in this process itself, because it kind of can help us alleviate those concerns and make sure they are coming in as a positive for a neighborhood and not as a negative. Uh, one of the biggest concerns was regarding a plumbing issue or a sewage issue behind the building. Uh, there were several comments about this. Um, however, the last incident based on our records was, it has been several months ago, if not years ago. It was hard to determine an exact date, but we're thinking about 18 months to two years ago was the last incident. It turned out it was a pump that failed. Uh, and because nobody was in that side of the building, there was nobody that could access the pump uh, when they had the emergency uh, indicator go off. And so actually having somebody move into that space is a big positive for deterring this or keeping this from ever happening again. But on top of that, JCW, because they're doing an extensive redesign build out, as part of that process, um, they're gonna scope the existing sewer line or sanitary line to assess its condition. They're gonna make any necessary improvements to that line. They're gonna install new sanitary cleanouts to the existing lines if they're already not in place. So they'll have access to clean it out if there's a need for that. Uh, they'll install a new sanitary lateral exclusively for the BioLife facility. So it won't be tied into the other larger commercial space. Um, Jeff is here. If you have specific questions about that build out or that sewer issue, he's happy to answer those for you. Uh, the next concern that was brought up regard most of the operations of the facility, including like loitering and vagrancy along the property. Um, there was some conflicting testimony about whether vagrancy was or is or was not a problem in that area, but just to kind of address it all in one space, having that building not be vacant will already deter a lot of that activity from in and around that parking lot and the area of that building. Uh, on top of that, they intend to install, BioLife intends to install like a full security alarm and camera system. Um, exterior cameras will be in place. Um, there were some concerns about drug use or certain types of people that might visit the facility. And I am here today to say BioLife has really high standards in their operation. Uh, so thing, physical exams are gonna be required for every donor. Um, medical screening, visual inspections for drug use, anything like that, all of that's gonna be part of their standard practice. Um, each plasma donation undergoes rigorous safety testing before the, it ever goes into use. It's basically held um, at a location until it clears the safety testing. Um, I know the school being in close proximity was a concern, but no donations will be accepted on for anyone under 18 years of age. Um, and on top of that, uh, for potential donors, you have to be able to provide documented proof of residency within that area. So your driver's license has to match your proof of residency like a utility bill. So they want all the name identifying information to show, hey, you're old enough, you live here, you're part of this community in a way that that money is gonna go back into the community it serves. Plus it deters you know, people just randomly showing up. Um, no, they have to be part of the system. Uh, they don't make cash payments. It's all prepaid debit cards. And on top of that, they utilize app-based technology now to make the appointments and show up so you're not gonna have a waiting line outside the facility. Um, and lastly, in regards to that, uh, Collected plasma is not sold on the open market at BioLife facilities. Because they're a subsidiary of Takeda, all of their plasma products go to Takeda for manufacturing pharmaceuticals and other needs for plasma products. Um, lastly, the, some of the negatives that we received, or negative comments we received regarded, were regarding the location itself. Um, I think one of them even said, you know, the vacancy was a positive, and I strongly disagree with that. Vacant space, especially in a commercial area like this one, is not a benefit to the surrounding areas. Um, the park, the vacated parking lot, the, all of that is going to be renovated, maintained, lighted, 
and once again contributing to our community and the neighborhoods surrounding that area. Uh, the redesign of the building is going to pull traffic away from that intersection and the school, and it's already zoned commercial space. I mean, that building was designed for a commercial use. We're just asking for the specific use here. So if approved, kind of to bring it all together, proposed zone change is going to, one, be compatible with the surrounding properties and the comprehensive plan of the city of Lubbock. Two, it's going to reoccupy a vacant space um, next to two major thoroughfares here in the city. It's going to create new jobs, add additional customers for those neighboring commercial businesses. It's not going to create any additional noise, smoke, odor, or any other common nuisances. And actually, we would proffer to you guys that it will likely decrease those in that area. Uh, and it's likely going to decrease any concerns regarding loitering, vagrancy, or safety around that vacant space. So thank you so much for your attention to this request. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And like I said, I've got Jeff and Luke here, and they can also answer your questions. We ask for approval of this request. Thank you, Laura. Mr. McBrayer? Yes, a uh, couple of questions, uh, and I'm, I think it's good that a vacant building will be filled up, and that should, if there is a problem with vacancy, right. should help solve that, and, and uh, new jobs are good. But uh, so you say your business is by appointment only, mm -hmm. and uh, what would be the maximum number of appointments this facility could fulfill in a day? Do you know? Luke, do you want to come up here and answer that? Luke, you've been summoned. <laughs> he has. Afternoon. My name is Luke Lenz. I live at 2812 Royal Acres Drive in Denton, Texas. I uh, appreciate the, the time and opportunity here. Uh, really, with the appointments, it's going to depend on uh, how long the center has been open, how many donors are frequently coming to that area. We try to start off on a smaller scale, really warming up to the community, building uh, kind of the notoriety in the area. So we'll definitely smart out slow. Everything is based off of a one to four ratio for our phlebotomists, just to ensure that we always have the ability to care for the, the donors that are uh, participating in the donation. And that is a regulatory requirement from the FDA, just as far as max number of people. So we'll always have a per employee, not an overall number each time. We'll have a max, you know, once the center is fully operational, and that'll be based on occupancy. Uh, currently, we are looking at, I believe, a 48-bed capacity for the Lubbock Center that, you know, two years down the line, three years down the line at full capacity, we would be able to run up to 48 donations at one time. Okay, and then uh, what would be your hours of operation? Uh, again, that would depend on how long the center's been open. Uh, initially, we would be shooting for 40 hours of operation a week, and then everything else would expand based on donations. My center in Denton it has been open for 15 plus years, and we are currently about 89, 90 hours of operation a week, over so, seven days. Okay, so some of your operation hours are in the evening? Correct, yeah, we will never be open later than 7 p.m. Okay, and part of my questions come from the fact that I used to have a retail business next to a blood plasma donor center, sure. and it was not a good experience for me. Uh, so one of my questions is, uh, it wasn't what happened inside the center, it was what happened outside the center, the loitering and the vagrancy and the people taking the wrappings off their arms and bleeding out on my sidewalk, which was uh, very distressing to me, you know. So uh, how do you assure that that kind of activity will not happen at this center? So part of that, uh, a lot of the policies have changed within plasma donation, a lot of that including HIPAA, the privacy for our donors, and that does extend to our parking lot. Therefore, we do not allow loitering in our parking lot, and that is even a sight of being able to view the people walking from their car forward. Second is, you know, we, we've talked a lot about being a good neighbor and, and really the amount of money that we're, we're wanting to invest, uh, and we're going to safeguard that. We're going to make sure that we're, we're not trashing the neighborhood, not having all those different things uh, going on. You know, that doesn't just tarnish the, the industry, but us, us in particular. And that is a lot of the things that we know, the negative history of the past within the plasma industry. And that's something that I think you could look at all of the, the biolife findings, FDA, all of the reports that we have published, uh, that we don't have that within our facilities. And finally, what is the uh, amount of investment do you expect to uh, put into this building? I would have uh, Jeff to approximate that to some of the building costs. I believe it's upwards of, of $3 million, um, just as far as the start to finish, but I believe he'd be able to answer that more, de more in detail. Before I turn that over, does anybody else have any other questions from an operations standpoint? Would there be any security outside? Other than the cameras, would there be any physical security presence? No, sir. We plan? haven't had the need for that in any of our facilities. Okay. 
Why don't you stick around? There may be some questions, and go ahead and answer that question on as, as far as the economic uh, development. Jeff Terrace with JCW Development, 100 Tower Drive, Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. Uh, regarding the cost, um, the way things have escalated the last couple of years, uh, I, I used to answer that question in the three to three and a half million dollar. Um, it's now more in the three and a half to four million dollar investment that we're going to be spending on this location. And that's in interior and exterior. Okay. Thank you. All right, Dr. Wilson. Yeah, so thank you, Ms. Pratt, for your thorough uh, presentation and all the detailed um, paperwork that you brought with you. Um, I was there at the PNZ meeting when this was discussed, and there were a lot of people there that brought some opposition. Um, but just from a personal aspect, I just want to relay how I feel about this issue. So when I was in college, I was a phlebotomist at one of our plasma notation centers here in Lubbock. Um, I think there is a lot of um, negative um, stigma that goes along with that. And I just want to reassure people that as a female working at one of these centers, never once did I ever feel unsafe. Um, there was maybe, I think some comments made at the PNC meeting about, well, they're gonna dump STD positive plasma in the alley. I, I, these these centers are highly regulated regulated by FDA and OSHA, and uh, as much so as a doctor's office and or a hospital. And so, the the relationship that these centers build with their donors is impressive. And I will tell you, as a single female, when I was in college, I would had donors who would wait around because our center that I worked at was open late until after dark, who would actually wait for me and say, "Miss Jennifer, please let me walk you to your car," because this center where I worked was actually in a probably more, way more dangerous neighborhood mm -hmm. than where BioLaf is asking to place their building. And then, as a physician, the importance of plasma and pharmaceutical research. Uh, most people outside of the medical facility actually don't know a lot about plasma. People more hear more about blood product, you know, just blood itself. But plasma is a very vital um, component of what I do as a physician and what we do in the medical community. And I think that this is an excellent project to be brought to our city and a wonderful use of a vacant building that no one else has had interest in. So I fully support this project. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Ms. Joy. Ms. Pratt, none of the owners live here, so when we have problems, who are we going to talk to? Probably BioLife themselves. Um, they're really invested in the communities that they um, move into, and while there will be landowner or landlord contacts because you know the landlord is still going to own the building, I think if there is concerns about the BioLife facility then it's the BioLife managers and the BioLife operators at that facility that will directly address those concerns. And just as Luke said, they're really invested in the communities that they serve and they want to be a good neighbor. And so those are the things that they need to hear about when they come up in order to help protect against that uh, stigma, the negative stigma that's previously surrounded these types of industries and communities. So what I hear from you is that they will have uh, people on the ground locally that, that we can Absolutely. go talk to, our citizens can go talk to Absolutely. about a problem. Okay, the other question I have is, as I understand it, the entrance is going to be to the west, um, and that you're going to have access will be on to uh, Indiana. Yes. And if you drive around the parking lot, I guess you'll ultimately be able to get on to uh, 50th Street, but sure. you're going to have to go through the parking lot. I would be concerned about a left turn coming out of that parking lot onto 50th, uh, onto Indiana. I would really be concerned. So possible no left turn there, right turn only. <coughs> have y'all talked about I, that? I will let traffic make that decision. If it gets to that place, I'm sure the city of Lubbock can evaluate that. <coughs> Uh, there is an entrance kind of further south on Indiana because that other facility that acts kind of mm -hmm. as a buffer between the bigger commercial space and the residential neighborhood, I think it's marked on that survey so you can kind of see it to the little f a little further south. Um, I know like this is a major intersection in the city and there is a lot of traffic that goes in and around that area. Uh, and so some of the hope is by turning it to face west, then at least we're not pushing it up towards the intersection itself, that at least a lot of the, tra uh, a lot of the traffic can turn 
into the facility further south into the commercial space. And ultimately, I think if that concern arises, City of Lubbock traffic operations will probably step in if that becomes a concern in that area. I would prefer we address it before we start having all those wrecks, which is already a problem out there. So, and I, I don't think that would be something that BioLife would be against if it would make the the access to their facility safer. Sorry, Mr. McGrayer's looking at yeah, my, <laughs> my map over here. <laughs> so, no, that's all. Ms. Martinez Garcia. And actually, I use that area quite often. I go to the Starbucks on 50. Yes. And the easiest way to get out of that parking lot so you don't have to deal with that traffic is you, the go area south. that, that's mm -hmm. where you go. Mm -hmm. I've never had a problem. It's actually pretty safe. Okay. And um, whoever thought about putting the business to face in that direction, good job. Yeah, and the city has already approved the address change. So that's why the specific zone change request has the 5047 Indiana Avenue reference, because they've already approved that portion of the building, the new address, which I think is also helpful when it comes to navigating the area. I mean, Google, Google Maps is going to pull it up coming yeah. off of Indiana and not coming off of 50th Street. And I looked up your company, and it is very credible. So, I mean, everything that you've stated, that you've all stated, is... You know, it's it's out there. That's the type of reputation that is reflected. So yeah. I think it's it's a positive for the area Thank instead you. of an empty building. Thank you, Ms. Martinez Garcia. All right. Thank you, Ms. Pratt, and welcome from Wisconsin. We know that the scenery around here is very similar to where you're from. So thank you for coming <laughs> in. All right. Anyone else wishing to speak in favor of agenda item six point seven? All right, the public hearing on agenda item 6.7 is now closed. Is there a motion to approve agenda item 6.7? Move to approve. Th thank you, Mr. Massengill, Dr. Wilson. All right, is there any further discussion on agenda item 6.7? All right, if no other discussion. All in favor of approval of agenda item 6.7, please say aye. 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 Any opposed by like sign? All right, motion carries 7-0. Thank you, Ms. Pratt. Thank, thank you. you. For you. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. You. All right, we're going to next move to agenda item 6.8. Um, prior to opening up the public hearing, I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Sager uh, to give us a, just a, a brief uh, overview of agenda item 6.8. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Agenda item 6.8 is zone case 3016E. The applicant is AMD Engineering. The purpose is a zone change from garden office and transition to local retail district C2 with a specific use for a self-storage facility. We sent out 25 notifications. We received zero in favor, 21 in opposition as of the date that this presentation was made. I know you received a petition at the dais um, this morning. Those have not been reviewed to see if they were additional responses. Um, 15 of those 21 were outside the notification boundary. This property is located south of 98th Street, west of Quincy Avenue. Here's the notification map showing the responses we received in opposition that were within the 200-foot notification boundary. Here's an aerial view of the subject property. There is vacant land to the east and south and a developed neighborhood to the west and north. The current zoning is garden office and transition. To the east is C2 specific use for a self-storage facility. To the north is R1 single family residential. To the west is garden office and single family residential. And to the south is two family and single family residential. Future land use plan designates this property for low density residential land uses. Here's some photos of the subject property and the surrounding area. Here's a graphic provided by the applicant showing the property they are proposing to rezone. And here is a site plan provided by the applicant. There are two entrances onto Rochester, but they have indicated that the entrance further south will have a, a gate with a Knox box and be limited to emergency access only. Here's some graphics provided by the applicant of examples of what this facility could look like.
Future land use map designates the property for residential low density. So while the requested zone change is not consistent with this designation, it is along a major thoroughfare and appropriate in this location. The request is in conformance with the zoning ordinance and appropriate with the surrounding area. As I mentioned, it is south of 98th Street, which is designated as a principal arterial, and east of Rochester Avenue, which is a collector. Staff recommended approval of this request. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval by a vote of five to three, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions. All right, thank you, ma'am. Are there any questions for Ms. Sager at this time? Dr. Wilson? Well, so this may be appropriate for later. I don't, I don't necessarily have a question for Ms. Sager. I have multiple comments on this case. Would we prefer to proceed with the public hearing part of it first, or would you like me to speak first? Let's, let's go ahead and okay, take any you. specific questions, and we'll, I'll okay. open the public hearing. No specific questions okay. at this time, right, Ms. Sager. Thank you. Mr. McBrayer? Would you go back one slide, sure. please, Kristen, so the, about the collectors? Yes. So designed for medium volumes. What do you consider medium volume? So you have three types of streets, basically. You have residential, collectors, arterials, and expressways, four types. So the intent of collectors is to gather the residential traffic from the residential streets and funnel it to the arterials. Okay. And how, yep. I mean, how many residential streets flow into this collector? Um, I mean, is it, can you go back to the... Yeah. To the aerial. Yes. I don't know if I can answer that. Yep, well, yeah. I'm just in the immediate area. Uh -huh. Okay. I mean, 99th for sure looks like 100th, the via cul de sac, 101st yeah. potentially. Just a couple, okay. Mm -hmm. Flowing directly into it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Sager. Thank you. All right, at this time, we will open up the public hearing for agenda item 6.8. If anyone is wishing to speak in opposition of this zone case, you may approach now. Good afternoon, and my name is Corey Savage. I live at 7023 99th Street, which is directly across the street from the proposed storage facility. Um, I think it's important to note on this aerial view as well that it does not have a lot of our phase two and phase three houses that are in the subdivision. It also does not take into account the amount of traffic that comes through our neighborhood to avoid Upland Heights uh, Elementary School. Um, <laughs> and also, the end of Rochester Street is like driving through a war zone. It is a pothole-laden uh, obstacle course. So um, I, I do not have any, I'm not going to in quote zoning and all this. I'm just going to tell you as uh, me and my wife live across the street with our family, uh, and this is supposed to be our retirement. Uh, once we get through working. She is a nurse at UMC. I'm a coach and a, a teacher. Um, this is a very large investment for our family, and it's supposed to be the last one. And when the lot was chosen and the house was built, it was, was with the understanding this would be garden office. And to me, that's a promise. And for us to make an investment, to some people it may not be a large investment, to us it is huge. To build our house and establish our family there, um, we did that on that promise. Um, I'm all for people's right to make money. The thing I love about Lubbock is it's about community. <laughs> and um, I feel like dropping a storage unit in the middle of a residential neighborhood is nothing community-based. Um, there are uh, commercial properties all around the area for sale. Um, and I think it would be much better suited elsewhere. But if, you, if our dining table sits on that corner of our house, if you open our blinds, we will stare at two 50,000 square foot buildings for the rest of our lives that we're there. Which brings up the topic, do we want to stay there? Well, now if we're in a market where interest rates are going up, it'll be hard for us to relocate. Can we sell the house for that sitting there? So I just ask that you take all these things into consideration um, when you're voting on this. Um, and I know you have a job to do, but I just ask you to please, if you lived across the street from this, how would you feel about looking at this every day? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Savage. Your coach, thank you. Good afternoon. How are you guys doing today? My name is Dennis Humble. I live at 7024 99th Street, directly across from Corey. His, his house and my house face each other. Same deal. We moved there 
uh, December two, six, 2016, it was open. It's going to be garden offices. That's why we moved there. And uh, <clears throat> we just feel like that, that uh, since it wasn't there when we moved there, that they shouldn't be allowed to do it. And we feel like there are legal reasons for that. But uh, it's my understanding that commercial zoning is supposed to be for hard corners only, five to 10 acres in Lubbock. That's what I understand. And this, this, they're trying to change this on a 2.64 acre deal, is the way I see it. And there's another issue that none of these maps show. If you look, and I know, uh, I was gonna put together a better proposal, but my, I had a brother pass away and I was out of town last week. But anyway, uh, right there on this map, if you look west, it's where 98th and Upload Cross, a quarter of a block south, you have a huge uh, uh, senior living center, three-story deal. Across that, you have an elementary school. So on this map, when you, like, you're going south on Rochester, turn right on 103rd, and when you get to the end of it, there's the elementary school. So what people have to do is they turn right on 103rd, go north on Rochester to get to 98th to avoid the four-way stop at 98th and up. So it's a huge problem. And we just feel like that uh, the, uh, the zoning that, that we presently have is better for our whole neighborhood. And, uh, you know, the, the legalities we're not experts in but it's my understanding <laughs> that you you can't that the comprehensive land use plan will not allow commercial zoning on a half half section line is what I've heard as well as allow entrance and exits for businesses but anyway we appreciate your time and we, we would just like for you guys to seriously consider it thank you thank you mr. humble Is there anyone else here to speak in opposition of 6.8? Mayor of Council Thomas Payne, I reside at 15309 FM 1730. Um, I'm really just want to give a little context to this case that isn't necessarily apparent. I'm the developer of the subdivision is called the Ridge, the adjacent subdivision. When I purchased the land uh, initially to develop the Ridge, uh, the subject tract and the, the rest of the land east of Rochester there was not uh, part of what I purchased because the seller didn't want to sell it. So I've never owned any of that land east of Rochester, but I did develop the lots to the west and I do own the little strip that fronts on 98 on the west side of Rochester. So the little stub of Rochester from that north alleyway north to 98th Street has not been constructed to date because no planting has occurred on either side of it. Uh, and so it's not really a, a street other than a name only right now. Um, I understand the residents' concern, uh, and I have some concern. The uh, the kind of bright white strip you see across on the north edge of the the gold box, which is south of 98th Street, is a large drainage structure that was constructed by the city of Lubbock. That did not exist when I purchased the land. Uh, to develop the ridge. The city came along later and wanted to construct that drainage feature and uh, I worked with uh, the seller that I purchased the land I purchased from and he agreed and I agreed to, to provide the easement so that the city could build that, that channel. It was necessary for the construction of 98th Street. There's too much water that comes across there to fit it in the street. And so that's why the city needed 
an additional area out of the private land to create the drainage capacity that was necessary to pave 98th Street. And I think everyone is entirely happy that 98th Street was paved at that location. I don't think anyone would be unhappy about that. Uh, I attended a meeting uh, of the residents, and you know, I think the, the big concern they've got is the access to Rochester. I think that's the biggest thing, particularly uh, access in and out adjacent to existing residences. Uh, I think they were at least more amenable to the idea of an entry off of Rochester further to the north of, of where the existing houses are. Uh, I would also make the observation that the, um, the proponent has the ability to build an entry directly off of 98th Street into the project. Um, as with uh, many things, uh, it, it would cost money to do it, and it would be more expensive to do that than it would to build a driveway off of Rochester. But they certainly have the, the, the right, the ability to cross that drainage feature with a bridge. So those are, that's all I've got to say. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Payne. All right, any further persons wishing to speak in opposition to 6.8? Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Hart. I live at 7026 99th Street. Excuse me, I'm a horrible public speaker, and I'm really nervous. So, um, All right, so don't be nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Um, so, Mr. Payne was saying he thinks that the residents would more, be more amenable to this project if the entrances were on 98th. I was out this weekend canvassing the neighborhood, and I emailed every one of you the protests. Not one person said, we're okay if it's on 98th. Not one. And I think... I supplemented some of those, so just just that. Um, second of all, the, the garden office zone doesn't need to be changed. Storage units in Lubbock within that area, I can count on both hands, 10-minute drive, 10-minute drive. Also, if he's concerned or if there's a concern about entrance and exit and additional building or cost incurred. He can go about a half mile north on Upland. There's five acres there, flat, commercial, for sale. Keep going north on Upland. There's more acreage for sale. All commercial already. My husband and I bought this knowing that it was garden office zoned. This is not what we bargained for. And I live at 7026. Granted, it's one house in from Rochester, but it's not what we bargained for. Another point, and I do have copies of pictures along with the hard copies of the protests, if you would like. The pictures that are represented, they're north, south, east, and west views. That's, that's kind of how realtors put pictures of houses for sale online. That's not a true representation of our neighborhood and how it invades our neighborhood. And I have pictures for each of you that I took. I hope they're in your packet because I did email them to Victor Escamilla, and he said that he would make sure that you would have them in your packet. And it shows the homes Sorry. and the close proximity. I have them in the presentation for you. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. So there's a few slides. So yeah, there's a few slides. Through. So, um, yeah, you, you, you'll go ahead and <clears throat> how do I go? Just and? Mm -hmm. Just the arrow down. Mm -hmm. Okay, right here, page down. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can see Mr. Mr. Savage, who spoke, on the, top, on the left picture 
that's his home. That's the front of his home, and he's going to be looking. That's, that's from the subject property looking east, so it's directly there, and that's the su southernmost part of the subject property. The one on the, the 99th looking west, that's from right outside my house, and that's what I would be looking at. And here, I'm standing on the subject property looking north. You see those houses. That's the Humble's house right there on 99th and Rochester, the one on the left. Um, then you see our alleys that would be right across from the entrance and exit that they're proposing. And land to the south, all of these are up. They're being finished out right now. So they're, they're, this is invading a neighborhood. It's not in keeping with a garden zone, a garden office zone. Garden office is going to have Monday through Friday, usually 9 to 5, more professional businesses. Gate access could be 24 hours a day with a wrought iron gate. These people that we don't even know are going to be coming into our neighborhood. And while most of their storage units are interior, there is a percentage that will be exterior. We don't know who these people are going to be. It's going, the, the traffic, it, we're not going to know these people coming in and out of our neighborhood. And from what I understand, <laughs> um, we were told it's better to dance with the devil you know and accept this with maybe a proposed change entrance on 98th Street, because if this doesn't go through, apartments could go up there. And there is no way that we would be able to protest an apartment complex. And then, hey, look at it this way. At least Rochester will be finished. I'm not really sure this is the way things should work. I, I, I'm at a loss about hey, if it's not this, it's going to be an apartment complex, so give your, give your okay for this. I'm, I'm, a lot of this stuff has just really been wrong. So that's all I have to say. Does anybody have any questions? I'm not sure I can answer them, but I'll give it a try. Nope. Thank you, Ms. Hart. Thank you for your time. For the record, you did an excellent job. You should not be nervous. <laughs> All right. Any other parties wish, wish to speak in opposition? All right. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of agenda items? You're welcome. Come on. Just give us just a minute. We're going to stick with opposition. I think we have one more. Here. Good afternoon. My name is Dan DeLong. And I live in the Ridge on uh, 102nd Street. And I'll be brief. Everybody before me uh, came up with the reasons. But I'd also like to point out that uh, about a quarter mile north on, uh, or I'm sorry, south on Upland is another self-storage unit that's planned to go in. About a mile and a half south on Upland, there are two brand new self-storage facilities and uh, a little bit to the east on uh, 135th Street is another sign proclaiming new home of A-plus self-storage. So not to get into anybody's business plan, but it seems to me that it's not needed. Furthermore, a lot of the traffic, because of the unfinished nature of Rochester, is out the uh, entrance from the ridge to the elementary school. And there's already plenty enough traffic headed for that elementary school. Um, I've spoken to several of my neighbors. 100% of them are against this change in zone. And uh, that's just my opinion, just a resident. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If anyone has an opposition to agenda item 6.8 but does not wish to speak, but you would just like to stand... You may do so. Would you like to speak? Yes. You're welcome to. All right, and those are, anyone else in opposition? All right, thank you. Hi, my name is Steve Block, 
I live at 7026 100th Street. Uh, again, I will be brief. Everybody has pretty well stated what I know to be true, and that is nobody in the ridge wants this kind of facility in our neighborhood. It's an eyesore. It, the aesthetics just take away from a very nice neighborhood. Even if the entrance is off of 98th, it doesn't matter. I know of no one in our community that wants this facility. And we have quite a few people here, if you want to stand up, everybody who's here from the Ridge. And uh, you can see, I don't think anybody's going to disagree with what I say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Block. All right, we will now move in those in favor of agenda item 6.8. Good afternoon. My name is Will Stevens. I'm with AMD Engineering at 6515 68th Street. Um, Jeff Dollenbach with Dollenbach Coal Architecture and Mr. Joey Holland, who is the owner and developer, are also here. Um, if you have any questions for them, I will just kind of give a little um, history to the case as far as, um, let's see. So originally back in July of this year, we came before you for a uh, rezoning of approximately seven and a half acres uh, for self uh, storage off 98th and Quincy. Um, the intent there was to build three buildings, and um, once once the zone case was passed through council, we kind of begun our engineering of that side and uh, quickly encountered uh, numerous engineering challenges, mainly being the elevation change of the property. I don't know if you've driven by it, but it's got about 15 to 16 feet of elevation change on it. Uh, and with the size of the buildings that Joey uh, uh, is intending to build, that, that unfortunately that elevation change just does not work. So our thought was, why don't we go off of Rochester, let's shrink the, the site down to four and a half acres, let's lose a building, um, and let's try and shrink everything down so we can kind of make it work in this area. And so that's what, uh, why we're here before you today for this zone case. Um, I want to just um, briefly reach, um, speak on a few of the comments made by the residents. And it's also worth noting that Joey and I both did spend time reaching out to the residents, um, not so much to change their mind, but just to hear their concerns and just kind of do our due diligence um, after we did re receive those letters in opposition. Um, so the first point I'd like to make, um, uh, and, and Kristen did, did speak on, on the entrance to the south off Rochester, it is intended that that is be gated that is to be gated um, with an ox box for emergency access only. Um, the first entrance that is off of uh, uh, closer to 98th Street, that is actually, if you look at the aerial view, um, that entrance is intended to be before that first alley there, um, north of 99th Street. And so we tried to put that entrance, sorry, I keep going back and forth. We tried to put that entrance as close to 98th Street as we could possibly get it. Um, with code and, and then you know again we're required to have two points of entrance and exit from the site f for uh, um, f fire department access that's a, that's a code requirement um, so like I said w we tried to push that that first entrance off of 98 uh, as close as we could get it uh, I also spoke with Joey after um, receiving numerous concerns about the traffic impact and you know, I asked Joey, what kind of traffic do you see on a busy day? And he said, you know, five cars, you know, five to 10 cars. So um, when you look at a traffic impact and you combine that with the fact that we try to put our entrance north of that alley before it really gets into the subdivision, I think that it doesn't, it may not address all of their concerns, but um, I think it does. I think it does do a little bit. And then I also just want to point out some of the, um, the code requirements for uh, specific use self-storage facilities in C2. Um, they are required when abutting residential street to have trees planted, um, two inch caliper, one per 30 feet, um, a six foot solid uh, masonry fence, brick, stone, or concrete shall be erected and permanently maintained. Um, so those are all things that we will be doing on this property um, to try and lessen the, um, you know, the view off Rochester. Um, and I, I know Joey's going to get up and talk a little bit more about his business, but I would be happy to answer any, um, you know, engineering-related questions or just any questions that you may have. All right. Thank you, Will. Yes, sir. All 
All right, anyone else wish to speak in favor of agenda item 6.8? Joey Holland, uh, P.O. Box 610, McAllen, Texas, 78505. Uh, Mayor, council members, city staff, I appreciate your time today. Um, having spent a little bit of time over the past year and a half in Lubbock, if I was a neighbor uh, in the Ridge, I would be standing right there next to them. Um, I don't think that our product and the storage uh, that has been developed or is being developed in Lubbock is comparable. Um, some of the things that I took away from today's meeting are public safety and quality of life. Um, that is something that we um, put forth a lot of effort to ensure uh, in ver our various communities around the state. Uh, we have just a closets adjacent to elementary schools. Uh, we have just a closets adjacent to high schools. Uh, we have a just a closet adjacent to a nursing home in Midland. Um, like Will said, I know there's been a lot of uh, concerns regarding traffic. On our busiest days, we'll have five cars in and out. Our average day, you'll have three cars in and out. Um, garden office, and kind of looking at what we have done in garden office, uh, if we were to take the whole four and a half acre track, about 20,000 square feet in various buildings, the amount of traffic that that would yield would be significant, uh, 300 square foot per employee. Um, Council Member McBriar brought up something earlier, um, you know, in a garden office type parking lot, it may or may not be gated. Uh, our hours are nine to six Monday through Friday, nine to three on Saturdays, and it's gated. Uh, our security is second to none. Um, again, uh, really, we don't yield a lot of traffic. And I, one thing that I don't want to throw them under the bus. I'm sure you guys are going to think I'm biased, but um, my right-hand man that handles all the construction and development served uh, Special Forces for 30 years, actually retired as Battalion Command Sergeant Major. Uh, when he moved to McAllen, uh, he obviously had choices where he was going to live, and he chose a subdivision adjacent to a justice closet. Um, again, for safety concerns and quality of life, um, knowing that you're not going to have cars zooming in and out all day, um, knowing that a person has to have a gate code and you know who's accessing uh, that gate is significantly different than even a house. Uh, if you build a house or a subdivision, uh, you can get rental, renters. Um, you don't know really who's going to be your neighbor. And again, in a mixed-use type product, if we were to do garden office and homes, you'd be looking at about 12 homes and 10,000 square feet of garden office uh, that's going to yield you about 75 cars onto Rochester daily uh, versus maximum for us about five. Love to answer any questions that you guys might have. And I do apologize for not being at planning and zoning. Our four month old who was then three was in <laughs> ICU. So uh, had a little bit going on at that point in time. And thank you, Mr. Holland. Yes, sir. All right, anyone else wish to speak in favor of agenda item 6.8? Blake Truitt, West Star Commercial Realty, 4415 71st Street. I'm the broker representing the buyer. Um, we started on this project um, back, I believe, in April. When we first identified some land. Um, Mr. Holland's uh, very strategic about uh, where he looks to put these locations in. He's already got a current location uh, he's working on here in town. He's got various developments, as he's mentioned, across the state. Um, he does build a very good product, as you guys saw in some of the renderings. Um, it's already been mentioned. Um, the property directly to the east has already been uh, gone through the zone change, was already uh, approved for self-storage facility. Um, we simply moved this footprint 100 yards uh, to the west, and uh, all of a sudden we've gotten a lot more opposition. But you know, for the record, that's already been zoned uh, self storage there to the east. So if there was another developer that decided to come in, that very well still could be developed as self storage. Um, <clears throat> another thing I wanted to mention was. Uh, there are some other facilities in the, in the you know, 
near area, but as this ridge develop, continues to be developed in uh, multiple phases, and as was mentioned, uh, there's some uh, single family, double family residences to the south, uh, some other multifamily developments coming online in the immediate area. And while there are a few people here uh, in opposition of the self-storage uh, facility, uh, I would dare to say that there's probably uh, just as many, if not more, in the same neighborhood that would be utilizing the self-storage facility. Um, one thing I've gotten to know about uh, Mr. Holland uh, in uh, making a friendship with him and a business relationship with him uh, is that he contacted me. Uh, he is a broker, but he said, hey, I'd like to have somebody in Lubbock uh, representing me. Um, he's been very good about uh, wanting to build relationships with the people in this city uh, and uh, in our real estate community. I've looked at several of his projects that he's done previously around the state and also want to mention that he's a very civic-minded uh, young man um, who gives back to his communities and he's a business leader uh, in his hometown of McAllen. And um, over the last year and a half that he's been here, he's had such a good experience in Lubbock. He said, you know, I wouldn't mind having a second residence in here. Um, he's got plans to build some other facilities here uh, in Lubbock uh, and other parts of town. And uh, is really looking forward to the opportunity to build a nice facility here uh, that will serve a lot of the residents in the immediate area. And it's for these reasons that I wish the council would seriously consider the approval. Thank you. All right, any other parties wishing to speak in favor of agenda item 6.8? All right, the public hearing is now closed on agenda item 6.8. Is there a motion to approve agenda item 6.8? Move to approve. Second. All right, now that we have a motion and a second, um, Ms. Dr. Wilson, I believe the floor is yours. Okay, as I stated earlier, I have you know, significant concern about this project. Um, from the beginning, I have met with many neighbors in the Ridge. I have discussed this with the Homeowners Association, probably received to the point of over 100 to 150 emails, calls, texts, Facebook messages with petitions with concern. So I want to start with my initial concern is the optics of this case, this zone case, from the beginning. So back in June, um, which we'll kind of talked about, was the other adjacent property to the east was brought to council to be have the specific use for, for a storage facility. At the time um, when Ms. Sager was presenting, I specifically remembered asking and looked back and said, is there any opposition to this project? Assuming as a rookie council member, that the neighbors in the adjacent neighborhood were notified. Um, and like I said, rookie mistake. So I went back and looked at the council agenda and not a single house in the Ridge neighborhood was notified of because of the, the distance regulations that we have for notification. Um, and so at that time, seven to zero, I believe we approved because there at the time we thought, okay, maybe, you know, this is a big piece of land. There's no opposition. We will move forward with this project. Um, and at the time, I had, I had some questions. Uh, there were some questions about fencing, and Will had talked about a wood fencing, which concerned me a little bit, but we moved forward. And then a few months later, it, the only person in favor of that from a, a uh, notification was the owner of now the, the land that is asked to be rezoned currently, which tells me that they were probably aware what was coming. Um, now, now, I'm going to talk about optics for what is fact, okay? So I cannot say that this was planned in advance. I do not want to say that, but I say the optics of it looks very concerning that we zoned a lot, a very large lot, and now we've asked for the, con, the, con, the rest of the adjacent property to complete the entire plotted land right there. So that's concerning for me because now we have a large lot that is zoned for the specific use. Even though Mr. Holland wants to build only currently these two buildings, it does not stop anybody else from bringing in more storage facility on the other large piece of property. Now, when I met with a lot of the members of this neighborhood, at first everybody was 100% opposed, very angry. You know, they felt like they were deceived as well. And we kind of moved through about a three-hour meeting between all of us um, and the 
Mr. Payne was there, a developer, you know, and everybody kind of had a chance to voice concerns. We did talk about with a large piece of property, other things that could come in. Um, you know, everybody was under the assumption it would all be garden office. Um, we kind of explained, you know, that's not always actually how zoning works in the city and it can be changed with the request of an owner. Um, but there, there are concerns with that as well. You know, this does not fit into our future land use plan. Um, we talked about a little bit with the half section line. Um, and, you know, what precedent do we set by changing and allowing commercial buildings to come in anywhere near neighborhoods on half section lines instead of where they're meant to be built? And so the other thing that I don't know if anybody's mentioned today is this neighborhood only has two access points. That is it. So they have the one which they are having tremendous concern with near the elementary school. And I am going to tell you I'm, for one, guilty. I have driven through their neighborhood last year after I dropped my daughter off at Upland Heights Elementary because I could not get out at the four-way stop sign. And I have actually done what they are complaining that people are doing because that was the only way to actually get out of this entire region was to drive directly through their neighborhood. And they, it's one road that drives through. So when we say that this is a collector road, yes, but it is one of their only two access points. And it's not a very good one. It's just kind of a rickety, bumpy road right now. It's not a well-developed road. So I have concerns with that because there is a traffic concern in this area, not just with this zone case, but with other ones we have discussed there's a lot of concern with traffic, just how this area was developed. So I have significant concern. You know, after I met with a lot of the neighbors, and I appreciate Ms. Hart coming up here, and her and I have had quite a bit of discussion back and forth regarding this. Absolutely, there are neighbors that are 100%, no matter what, against this, that we do not want it there, absolutely not. There were others that were like, you know, we want to be good neighbors. We're very pro-business. We're very, very pro-development. Maybe we could get some of those concessions. Maybe we could rotate this where all of it faces 98th with the egress ingress over the drainage ditch and then put a nice eight-foot masonry fence with really nice landscaping so people like um, Coach Savage, when they look out, they're not looking directly into a commercial building, but more so at a masonry fence with some nice landscaping. And that was kind of a, a maybe if this is absolutely going to be how it has to be, I might could live with this. And this was never anybody's go-to plan. So we had discussed that. I discussed that with Mr. Holland as well over some, some communication. But that seems to be not an option because of cost. It is an option building-wise just because of cost. It, it didn't, they did not want to change their building plan. Um, so I have, I have significant concern. You know, as a citizen, as a, just a person that lives in a neighborhood, I would not want to walk out my front door and look right directly into a commercial storage unit. Uh, I do think his buildings are beautiful. We looked at many examples together. I think there are many wonderful commercial lots in our city that we're happy to have this business at. Um, but I do not think that this is the lot for this business. And I have concern for further development of storage facilities now onto this adjacent lot. Um, that is now next to it, um, which also concerns me. So for all of those many reasons, I am not in support of this project going here in this zone change. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Ms. Joy? Can we put back up the overhead visual where it shows? Yeah, right there. We'll start there. Um, we have approved in other cases, some C2 specific use on the corners, okay? This is not a corner. This is an L, which goes directly down into a neighborhood. The 200-foot 200, 200 notice has always been a problem for me. That's a minimum requirement under the code that we have to give notice within 200 feet of that property. It, in my opinion, it needs to be further. In this case, it captured some of your, your residents, whereas the prior um, zone change did not. Future land use plan, this is low density where this sits currently and surrounded on two sides by residential and heavy what I call heavy residential. What we did, and if you can give me, um, Kristen, the one that actually shows the C2 specific, there, that one, thank you. What we did back in, I think it was 2004, 
we made that change, couldn't have been that long ago, that to local retail, which is C2 specific use, and that pink. And that's where I believe uh, the proponent was talking about that intended to build some facilities and then change their minds and didn't do it. So now what we're left with, which is one of my concerns, is a huge C2 specific use just standing there waiting for somebody to come along and gobble it up. Look immediately to the south. You've got residences on, on a 99th and 100th. Um, and then we've got this little odd piece that says it's, it's unsubdivided. So we've kind of got a mess right here, in my opinion, in terms of zoning. Now, it's my understanding that council can initiate its own action to change a zone. And in my opinion, this particular C2 specific use that we approved previously, we need to do that because that's dangerous where that is right now. This is not uh, a good zone um, case because if it was just on a corner, maybe, that's a maybe, but certainly not with this L, which projects itself into two neighborhoods, the one that is south um, of the L and all of the neighborhoods that are to, um, to the west. So I can't support it either. I am very concerned. I do not believe it's in conformity with, in fact, I know it's not in conformity with the future land use plan, which designates this area as low uh, residential density. Thank you, Ms. Joy. Uh, Ms. Patterson-Harris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um, was really trying to take time to look at this, and I, I too, have some concerns. I uh, One of the concerns, I think the gentleman indicated that on an, a busy day, there's about five patrons that show up to the location. And understanding that you know that business, I just really don't believe that there is ever really a, a, con a guaranteed way to really determine how many times someone may go in and want to take a look at their property. I have a concern because of, of Rock Rochester. And, and my concern is, is not just the traffic itself, but the type of traffic. Normally when individuals take things to storage locations, they don't put them on the back of their car to do so. All the time, I'll say that. So we're talking about larger vehicles that would be frequenting this location. I am very concerned. I, my ears tend to perk up when I have citizens concerned about the things that will impact them in the neighborhood, because we often refer to the fact that things must be done so that people are able to live peaceably in their homes. So with the type of traffic that I'm concerned with, I, can, I cannot uh, support this. I, I must stand with the citizens who are homeowners and investors in this, this particular area. Nothing against folks who don't live in Lubbock, but there is some partiality. And um, I'm, I'm just concerned, and there's no way that I can uh, actually actually support this, this request. Thank you, Ms. Patterson Harris. And Mr. Mr. McBrayer? Yeah, I, I don't know that uh, I'll take it for granted or assume that, that five cars a day is a reasonable amount. That doesn't concern me as much. And, and certainly, I think it's a wonderful product compared to other storage facilities I've seen. I'd welcome you uh, to uh, our city to build that. I just have to agree with the citizens here that that is not the appropriate location for this facility, as good as it looks um, on paper. Um, so I just don't think I can, I would not be supporting this either. Uh, Ms. Joy, I believe Ms. Martinez Garcia had one final, one quick comment. She's informed me. I'm in agreement, and I just want to say that even while we're sitting on the dais, we've had a number of emails 
that are against this, and I am going to go with the citizens as well. All right, thank you. Now we've, uh, this time I've got a motion to second. Uh, and remember we're on a motion of in favor of, all in favor of approval of agenda item 6.8, please say aye. And those opposed, please say nay. 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 All right, motion fails 7-0. All right, we are now moving to agenda item 6.12. Uh, members of the council, this is the second reading of the Lone Oaks LC uh, 144 acres annex annexation. Um, I guess at this time I'd entertain a motion on agenda item 6.12 as approval of the second reading. Move to approve. All right, I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on agenda item 6.12? All right, all in favor of approving agenda item 6.12, please say aye. 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 Any opposed by like sign? All right, 6.12 carries 7-0. All right, there has been some discussion of agenda item 6.13. Uh, this is the, if you, council will recall, we'd moved this um, several, several times to get to this specific date. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, issues have been addressed and um, Mr. Atkinson, would you like to briefly address that prior to a motion? Thank you, Mayor, Council. Yes, uh, they have come into compliance. We were out there yesterday. I have that report if you wish me to read it. I know they were out there today and I've not heard that it was any different. All right. Uh, if I could entertain a motion to approve 6.13. Thank you, Ms. Second. I got a motion and a second. All right, so is there any further discussion on 6.13? All right, Ms. Joy? When you say they're in compliance, uh, does that mean they've removed uh, their rental operation, their Penske operation, uh, that they've brought all their materials uh, inside or in conformance with what uh, the prior agreement was. Mayor, with your permission, I'd like to ask Eric Rajino to come up. Eric, you're on deck. <laughs> Mayor, Council, so currently it is zone C4 with a special exception. I'm gonna go over what that special exception is. It basically restricts them to storing any plant materials, garden and yard equipment, along the front of the store only. So as of today, they are not in compliance with the C4 with the special exception. Now, if the council was to move forward to the C4 without the special exception, they would be in compliance today. They have left the other items with the exception of, um, they've removed the store, the uh, lumber was a big issue in being in compliance with the, just a C4 designation alone. Uh, we did inspect that yesterday. We inspected again this morning. The only lumber that we see is what the active, what the active trucks are actually unloading. Um, so to answer your question, Ms. Councilwoman Joy, not compliance with C4 with the special exception. Without it, they would be. Okay, part of my concern is I know what's allowed in C4. There's a long list. But when you file an application to be a home improvement store, that is one classification. There are other classifications that call for you can have a rental facility or a station or some other things. What they have done effectively, and what I'm afraid will happen the minute if this is approved, is they will go right back to what they were doing before because planning told, told us at, at the last meeting would they be in conformity with what they were doing at the time if they were in a C4? I don't know how you can couple different uh, businesses into one when they are listed individually. They didn't apply to be a rental store. They applied to be a home improvement store. I am concerned that they won't continue to just do what a home improvement store is authorized to do under the statute. I'm concerned they're gonna put all their rental equipment right back out there along with their Penske trucks, and they're gonna just do the same thing, and, and we're gonna to be told there's nothing we can do about it. So if we leave it the way it is now, if we don't change it, we're good, because now they're in compliance. 
So why change it? Well, there, the one violation they have related to C4 that they were not in compliance of when the council last met was the lumber specifically, the lumber storage. Now, as far as storing the equipment, all the other operations, they can do that under a C4. I understand, but if we don't change it, they can't. That's correct. They'd have to, they'd have to limit it to just what's adjacent to the store. That's right? correct. So all the items would have to be removed for them to continue to operate as... That's correct. Yep, that's correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions for me? Dr. Wilson. One quick question. We, we talked a little bit about this morning about this being a different, kind of different store than the rest of them where, where they unload their trucks. Yes, ma'am. So do trucks come in every day? Trucks do come in daily is our understanding. And you know, related to some of the other home store, the, the, the home improvement stores we see, a lot of the unloading occurs in the back for whatever reason. The unloading of trucks here occurs in the front parking lot. But as long as that material was actively moved, if it's zone C4, they would be in compliance. Now, if they start storing material there, again, as far as the lumber specifically, then that would be a violation and it would be a code violation. Okay, so, not, so I think my concern is, is a lot of that that was dropped off by the trucks mm -hmm was stored. I mean, yes, you know, clarifying what is the definition of stored versus unloading and moving, right. you know, is it sitting there for more than two hours? Is it there overnight? Uh, I think needs to be something that we work with this store because I would go by every day and these 20 foot tall stacks of lumber and piping and everything were out there. You know, if it's coming in daily and it just takes a few hours with forklifts to move in, then I understand that. You know, I'm not sure what physical barriers they have to unloading behind the store as in the others. But, you know, where do we clarify what is storage and what is just unloading a truck? What they've indicated to us that when the, when the trucks come in, anything and everything that comes with the truck that would be in violation of C4 would be stored within that same day. And they typically, a lot of that, it may take throughout, it may take all day, but... Uh, if we went back and that same lumber was there from the truck before, that's where we would begin having an issue. It would be a potential code violation at that point. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Martinez-Garcia. And I think that there, the store itself was going through some remodeling. So there was a reason for additional lumber that was being held. Is that not correct? Yeah. As far as some of the shipping containers that were out there, we had, of course, those, we had some challenges with those, uh, but apparently those had some storage, and of course, you may recall, rejog my memory if I'm out of line, but uh, they were adding additional storage capacity for lumber, and so the shelving was in those actual bins, and I believe that's been completed. Ms. Patterson-Harris. Thank you. So, Mr. Eric, uh, whatever remodeling that they were doing, is that complete at this moment? It is my understanding the shelving for the lumber is complete. And, Kristen, have you heard anything different? Okay. It is complete. Yes, ma'am. So, based on that, there should not be any errors or any need to uh, s store some of that lumber because things have been completed so that they can put them in the appropriate place in the facility. That is correct. And they would be in violation if they were to begin storing it again on the parking okay. lot. And the specific use is for a home improvement store within closed garden center. Correct. I'll let Kristen speak to that. Thank you. So the specific yeah. use today is C4 specific use for a home improvement store within closed garden center with three conditions. Number one, that the outdoor, dis outdoor display of portable buildings, plant material, and garden and yard equipment is limited to the front sidewalk in a manner as to not affect pedestrian access or safety. Mm -hmm. Number two, that 150 adjacent parking spaces to the south shall be used in conjunction with Home Depot. And number three, that no product shall be stacked above exterior garden center chain link walls. This was approved in 1996. Okay. Thank you. All right, I don't believe I asked or we had a motion. Did we? We, all right. we have a motion in a second. All right, is there any further discussion on agenda item 6.13? All right, all in favor of approval of agenda item 6.13, please say aye. 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 All opposed by like sign. Nay. All right, motion carries 6-1. All right, we are now moving to agenda item 6.14. And I guess this is where I get to call Mr. Keenum to the stand. Called to the stand. That's... Please raise your right hand. Oh, sorry.
Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. This item 6.14 is a resolution to utilize for a public interest the right of condemnation by this body to uh, acquire land at Upland and 66th Street. And so um, there's a couple of slides, the pro parcels that we are looking to acquire. Uh, here you see outlined in blue, parcel 115 that we have a piece of it there on Upland Avenue and then a piece on 66th Street. And then we have the legal description with the meets and bounds for that, that describes that, that portion. And then parcel 115A is another piece further south on um, 66th Street. This is for drainage purposes to convey the water from west. We'll have cover culverts going underneath Upland and um, we have we have attempted to to obtain this both of these parcels of land and have been un unable to do so and so at this point we are asking um, the council for you to exercise your rights as a political body all right thank you mr keenum and the legal description of that as well sorry all right I right, entertain a motion for the condemnation by eminent domain, Mr. Embraer. Mayor and Council, uh, uh, I make a motion for condemnation by eminent domain as set forth in the resolution before the Council authorizing condemnation of property by eminent domain, determining the public necessity for the project, authorizing the acquisition of real property interests by easement or in fee simple, and authorizing all other acts to complete condemnation proceedings. I move that the City of Lubbock, Texas authorize the use of the power of eminent domain to acquire easements in two parcels to wit, parcel number one, parcel 115 being a .690 acre parcel located in section 30, block AK, Lubbock County, Texas, being a portion of a 5.14 acre tract described in volume 8542, page 37 in the official public records of Lubbock County, Texas, and being further described by meets and bounds in Exhibit A attached here to and incorporated herein, and Parcel 2 being Parcel 115-A, being a .440 acre parcel located in Section 30, Block AK, Lubbock County, Texas, being a portion of a 5.14 acre tract described in Volume 8542, page 37 in the official public records of Lubbock County, Texas, and being further described by meets and bounds in Exhibit B, attached here to and incorporated herein. All right, thank you, Mr. McBrayer. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Joy. All in favor of approval of agenda item 6.14, please say aye. 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 Any opposed by like sign? All right, motion carries 7-0 as to agenda item 6.14. And with that, it is 4.03 on September 27th, and council is adjourned.